Yo ho ho! Uh, what's going on, boys? It's just Grim Reaper bringing you One Punch Man, Chapter 156 Review. This was a spectacular chapter. There were a lot of amazing things that came up, not just in regards to art, but in regards to plot points, and in regards to predictions, and in regards to speculation as to what is really going on in the world of One Punch Man, in regards to power levels, in regards to characters who we don't even know, we don't even know, in regards to new characters that have just showed up, and what their relation is to dead characters, we don't know exactly. We can, we can say that this sage god is what Orochi was resurrected as, but we don't necessarily know exactly what happened in that scenario, and we're going to talk about and elaborate upon that topic more so in this video. So remember to like the video, subscribe if you enjoy reading um, and listening to videos about One Punch Man. This is the channel that's for you. This is the channel that's for you, bro. For you, 100%. Um, if you want to discuss yourself, if you want to put out your own ideas and speculate with myself and others, join the Discord. The link is in the description. Now, without further ado, let's begin. There is a lot to discuss here. One of the more entertaining topics, one of the topics that I've seen discussed unanimously throughout the community, it would... It would it would almost be correct to say that it is the most discussed topic in the community in regards to chapter 156 is the defeat of Flashy Flash in the fight, the defeat of Platinum Sparrow in the fight, but as well as the victory of Gorilla in the fight. We all know that the flashy wank and the flashy sucking has been increased several notches since he arrived in the surface team. I didn't necessarily understand the depth of of flashy wankers, flashy suckers, flashy enjoyers that are in the community, but there's quite a bit of them. And their strength and their capability to pretend, to fantasize, and and to straight up just make up stuff out of nowhere is strong. And I would and I would say damn near unprecedented. Regardless of the case, I am very, very happy to see that there are people in the community who are as invested in their favorite characters, in in good characters as I am. This shows that these people are not only paying attention and not only enthusiastic about the story, but they actually love One Punch Man. They're that invested into the story. They truly love One Punch Man. And that's not what we're here for. We love to see people who love what we also like, and, and we love to see them being enthusiastic about it. And that's the real reason that we're here for. Flashy Flash did an amazing job in this fight. Aside from all the winking, Flashy Flash did an amazing job in this fight. We got to see a, a new attack from him, two new attacks from him, actually, two new named attacks from him. Um... Just, just the fact that he was able to compete and keep up with these guys for, for this long. And I know when I say compete, I'm kind of stretching it out. He didn't really do that much. But the fact that he was in there keeping up with these guys, it was spectacular. It was spectacular. It's what we expected from Flashy Flash. And to see our expectations be fulfilled in such a splendid manner, in a great manner, and up against the competition that he was up against, was, was you see why the Flashy Suckers came out. You see why they were so loud. You definitely understand why they were hyping up one of their favorite characters so much. It was impressive. But there's more to it than just Flashy Flash's defeat or his, his stylistic uh, fighting capabilities. His flashy fist that came out when he was like just straight rage mode. Was, ah, ah, trying to take off on Platinum. Platinum. Catch. Whatever it is. Flash. Oh my God. But there's more to that. Along the way, Flashy delivers his flashy hits or flashy fists technique. It gets stopped by what, after doing several rereads, seems to be Platinum Sperm's tentacle. Now, there he has a defensive attack or technique that he calls Platinum Rings, which we can define that as, where he's whipping his tail around in circular motions. That's what seems to have stopped Flashy Flash's assault. But then... Platinum Sperm mentions this. We know we get the whole flowing feet combination, but the important part is here, and I'm going to read it verbatim. You're so full of openings. Is there something wrong with your spirit? Just like Darkshine, when you're outclassed by someone in your speciality, you abandon your duties and put all your effort into protecting your own pride. That's what being a hero is all about, right? A being who truly wants to help the weak does not exist. How close exactly, or how 
how much of a of a parallel how strong are the similarities between dark shine's issue and flashy flash's issue one of the things that if we were to be forced to have a redraw one of the things that i would like to be to have elaborated upon is this the sentiment or the explanation of platinum sperm's claim well we can definitely tell that this has been the case for the fight these guys are matching flashy flash's capabilities in regards to speed and flashy literally can't land a hit on them that's not something that we point out for no reason those are things that are added to the frustration that we see here one of the first few times where we actually see Flashy Flash talking to himself in a fight, him monologuing within his own head, is him saying that, like, man, these guys are faster than me. This is this is not acceptable. The next thing we see is him raging out white-eyed with an attack we've never seen. It left him with openings, as we saw Platinum Storm take full advantage of and mention here. But... Throughout the rest of the fight, Flashy was doing a pretty okay job of even deflecting attacks that were coming at him. Because if you're able to perceive what's coming at you, of course you're going to be able to... And that's that's within Flashy Flash's skill level. So it's not crazy or out of the ordinary or, or bad or like bad writing. That, that's just fine that he was able to block some of their hits, some of the, uh, deflect some of their attacks as well. But I'm wondering at what point is Flashy acknowledging their speed? Because is it, is it, am I to believe that at this point in the fight is when Flashy's find the reason that, oh man, these guys are faster than me. Like, I can't do anything about it. Am I supposed to take it like that? Or am I supposed to take it as like, throughout the entirety of the fight, they're overwhelming him. And it's just now at this point where he just, he's acknowledging that he really can't keep up. He's been experiencing being outsped the entire fight, but it's now that he's declaring it. That seems to be more plausible. That seems to have more support. That seems to be more reasonable than to just expect that like, Flashy Flash has been doing his best mid fight and it's just now that he's realizing that like oh they're way faster than me I can't know it seems that the entirety of the fight this has been happening so am I to understand it or am I to interpret it as Flash Flash has been having openings the entirety of the fight because he's seen that these guys are faster than him if that's the case is this worse than Darkshine Darkshine, mid-fight, mid-fight, he was still in, in an instance, and Goro was still sleeping, but I want to say that Darkshine gave some effort, he still put in some work, I'm, and I'm pretty sure the double bazooka, Sparlight double bazooka, was after Darkshine had been shocked with fear, intimidation, <laughs> of, of Goro's growing strength and capabilities his ferocity so i guess i'm trying to map out what exactly happens to these heroes when their confidence gets shaken to this degree because we have other confident damn near cocky heroes in the hero association whether they're s class or a class we've seen some pretty some pretty cocky self-centered individuals amongst the association is this what we're to expect as a reaction from them there's no reason we would believe that uh, a guy like Dark Train and a guy like Flashy Flash are similar. They don't have any similar personality traits whatsoever. Flashy Flash is nowhere near uh, near as outspoken as Dark Shine is. Nowhere near as outspoken as he is. So we don't even get a chance to see how the intricacies of Flashy Flash's personality. We got to see a little bit of it in the, in the discussion that Flashy Flash had with the two ninjas on the bridge when he detailed all of his secret assassinations and assassinations and exploits um, outside and behind the back of the Hero Association, but. That wasn't really giving us that much information about his personality and about, you know, the way he talks, his customs or jokes. With Tom McSamar, for example, we see how he is. Maybe it's just because he's often in the presence of Ian Ian, but he's often instructing him or pointing out life lessons or telling him to stop bleeding. Your your journey down the way of the sword hasn't ended yet. Like speaking in really I want to say cryptic, but maybe poetic or 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 I'm missing the word. I'm missing the word. Like, not ancient, but uh, cryptic is probably one of the best words to, to use. It, he has his own dialogue. Let's <laughs> just leave it to that. Atomic Samurai's dialogue is unique to him. If you were to hear or to read um, his panels or his uh, speech bubbles without having a character there, you could probably pick out that it's Atomic Samurai. But I don't know if you could do the same for Flashy Flash. So, 
I guess I'm trying to question, and it's a question to pose to you guys, and it's speculation moving forward on in the series. What are we to expect Flashy Flash to do in order to overcome this, I guess, supposed presentation? With Dark Shine, we had extended time period of us seeing the effects of this trauma, right? He was curled up on the surface. He didn't necessarily know if he could do it. We saw the effects of the intimidation physically on Darkshine. As well as in his dialogue. We haven't gotten a chance to see much dialogue from Flashy Flash after having this intimidation or this, or this realization. We haven't gotten to see that. So I'm actually interested to see the character development and growth that Flashy Flash is going to have the opportunity to get here. We really don't get that for him. <laughs> we really don't get opportunities for Flashy Flash to grow as a character. So if this is the first instance that we're getting of that. His This is the first... I guess appearance of the road he's going to be taking later on. I want to see more of it. And I'm interested to see how he is going to deal with it. Because he's... Dark Shine's like... Fear and stuff in his... I don't want to say childish, but immature way of dealing with this shock of competition. Was unique. I wasn't expecting it of a big, strong cock. He's a guy who's always talking like junk. Or always being so confident. So with a guy like Flashy, who isn't necessarily like... So flamboyant. Maybe that's the wrong word to use. Um, So like prideful vocally vocally prideful about his capabilities how is he going to react to it are we going to see him curled up on the surface when he gets back up is he going to want to leave the association because now there's somebody who's like there's people out there who are stronger than him multiple people there are who are much faster than him um or are we going to see him like get even more determined and work on his craft even more so to change the game up i don't know if that's going to be darshan's reaction i don't know that Every step of the way, we could say he got some of his confidence back on the surface, but Fury Ugly matched his physical capabilities, and then Golden Sperm did as well. Took him out even. So I don't, I don't, I don't know what's next for Flashy Flash. I don't know how he's going to react to this revelation, but it'll be interesting to see. Not just because it could potentially trash the Flashy Suckers. To, 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 to a degree un, unseen anywhere, bro, where now your heroes having emotional ears. Because in the, in the Atomic Samurai Flashy Flash debate, Atomic Samurai hasn't had a, an emotional problem. He, he hasn't had some, like, pussy shit to where, like, he can't, like, overcome a problem. No, he's actually thinking through his issues. Even in the, in the, in the retcon portion with the FAS, Atomic Samurai was overcoming, in, in the very same instance, in the very same instance, thinking through the problem that he had with Black Sperm and was actually able to overcome the issue. So it's not the same thing. Atomic Samurai is going to have a different form of growth. It's like TikTok Master is going to have a different form of growth. Just like Adinos is having a different form of growth. They're all going to grow in a different manner. Saitama is the most different out of all these characters. He's already reached a certain level, a certain pinnacle of power. And now he's exploring the capabilities. That's not the right word to use. And now he's endeavoring upon becoming the best hero. Not the strongest hero. So... What does Flashy have to endeavor after now? Question. Platinum Sperm. I had a gripe about Platinum. We're on the first part of the chapter still. I don't like how quickly this fight ended. Yes, last chapter wasn't all of the Flashy Flash Platinum Sperm girl fight. It wasn't all of it. And we got a bunch of other things in there as well. But... I don't like that Platinum didn't get a really good chance to display the rest of his capabilities. I'm not saying that he has others. I am not saying that. I'm not adding feats or powers to a character. I'm saying to see Platinum Sperm versus Garou for more than just four or five panels where 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 Platinum is like getting or they're clashing in this constellation format where the narrator is telling us what's going on. I wanted to see more of the action. I wanted to see more of the capabilities. One of the best panels... I love that panel of this chapter. It's, it's, it's honestly probably my favorite panel of the chapter. It's after Goro breaks through Platinum Sperm's uh, Platinum Rings, connects with them, and as he's just smacking them down, they're flying down full speed towards the surface, and they, they separate, they crash, right? Goro jumps off, lands on his hands and feet. In the very next panel, my boy Platinum Sperm gets up just screaming, bro. Looking cock diesel, bro. With the Majin Buu tentacle tail all the way down, bro. Just abbed up already, bro. Looking like Super Buu, bro. Bro, Platinum was that thing. This panel was that thing, bro. I loved it. I loved it. 
one of my favorite panels of Platinum Sperm, of Black Sperm as a character in general. <coughs> and Black Sperm has some of the most iconic panels drawn in the entirety of this arc. I pen <coughs> to remember nostalgically for the entirety of the rest of the story of One Punch Man. He's a very, very, very memorable character. This pose right here, bro, spitting up blood from his teeth, bro, gritting his teeth out there, just spread wide, getting right back up from that big ass hit where your platinum sperm got broke, where your platinum ring got broken through, bro. And then he yells, Goro next. Man, I would have loved to see a whole nother sequence through that. Don't get me wrong. The consequential panel after that, where Goro's like, let me pass through, bro. The mimicry, the reflection, bro. The same exact one that platinum hit on Flashy and Goro, bro. Seeing that one. Oh! Bro, it's already started with the other Platinum one, and I saw one or two from this when this post for Girls version. But this should be one of the greatest meme formats we have in all of One Punch Man. We've had some pretty, some pretty badass ones, bro. We've had some pretty badass ones, bro. But, bro, the Platinum Garo, let me come through, or, or let me pass through for a moment. <laughs> the Garo is like, let me pass through for a sec. Fire, bro. That shit was straight fire, bro. But I needed more of platinum. If that would have occurred, we would have got that that compilation right there. And some he wouldn't have blown up, or he would have got snatched or sent somewhere or something like that. And the fight would have continued. I, I would have loved that. But right now, this sequence is about, or maybe even less than the Goro versus uh, Bomb fight. And I'm still holding that fight above a lot of these other fights. Like I still have Goro versus Bomb over Goro and Bang, and. To be honest, it's about the same, about the same as this part, is this fight right here, in my regards. That's how much I loved the sequence, the back and forth, how much you could see every single punch. You could track every single punch there. You could do it. It's not like where you're seeing like a flurry and just like, oh, he's punching a bunch of times and he's blocking a bunch of times. No, it's, if you watch the Bomb versus Goro fight, reread that. You can see every single punch, every single kick, and every single response to that. You see when Goro punches, or when, when Bomb punches, and then Goro ducks, and then tries to kick, or Goro tries to kick out of the way, and then you see the response to that. You see every single flowed motion, every single step. We follow that. I would have loved to see that for Platinum Sperm versus Goro. It was, bro, bro, yes, yes. To get to get more elaboration, to get an expansion upon um Goro's fighting style, the God Fist, and how... It's the difference maker in a fight where you're matching skill, speed, strength up against Platinum Sperm. That would have been spectacular, bro. Indomitable, bro. In that thing, bitch. Cinematic, bro. It would have been it would have been a blockbuster, bitch. See that, bro? Oh my god. But this was fine too, because we got this badass, the thumbnail for the live reaction. Good out here right now. Ah. All in all. This fight was great. But now that we've discussed Flashy Flash's part, Platinum Sperm's part, and maybe I guess we could talk about Platinum Sperm's like overall strength now, right? Because is Platinum Sperm the highest of high dragons? This is a conversation that we need to have because right now, it's very, very clear, very, very clear that a lot of webcomic readers in particular, and I, because I haven't, I haven't not noticed that. I haven't not noticed that. The majority of the people who are pushing these narratives try to say that, oh, girls this level now, or Flash is this level now, period, are webcomic readers. And I'll make the point clear again. The continuity has changed extensively. That is not true. That is not true. This is not the webcomic. And there are much, there's much more information, facts, and feats in this series, to compare Goro to many other characters, many other dragons in this series, it's because his speed is exceptional now. Does not mean that he does not match up to other characters, and the same for Platinum Sperm. Case in point, why I made the poll question, Platinum Sperm versus Rover. Because I want to make it clear that we should be under no impression that Platinum Sperm's power or Goro's power is matching the durability or the capabilities of Rover so far. Not the same thing. Not the same thing. And we can stop pretending. It's because his character looks cool. It's because he's evolved past a lot of other guys who are strong as well. Does not mean that he's now stronger than these other characters who have set pinnacles, feats, achievements, standards. So let's stop that. Let's 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 stop the whole power creep bullshit. Where the next character that shows up is now stronger than everybody else. That's not how One Punch Man works. That's not how the majority of stories work. This is some 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 shonen misconception. 
that you guys like to push. That's that's not how it works. Story progression is not the same thing as the power scaling's progression. That's not the same thing. It's because the next obstacle is the next obstacle does not make it bigger, more threatening. It can be different, but it's not. It doesn't have to necessarily be more so or grand, more grandiose than the previous problem. That's that's not how it works. That's not how a climax works. That's that's novice, basic, elementary storytelling, and that's not what we're doing here. That's not the type of story that we're reading. I'll make it. I'll make it very very clear. We've seen monsters like Beefcake, Vaccine Man, Carnus Kabuto, and Boros in the first forty five chapters of this story. We're now in chapter one hundred and fifty six. And, you're, and, and the, all, all the other somewhat chapters in between and, and little hashtag chapters in between. And we're going to continue to pretend like these characters are stronger than, than Boro still, who still hasn't been matched in any sense yet. In any sense yet. All the other characters that I mentioned beforehand as well. It's just now that we're getting another character who may be as durable as Elder Centipede right now. In regards to Rover and now in regards to this Sage. So I'll make it very, very, very clear and I'll reiterate it again. Let's stop pretending and faking like be that Goro is the strongest character, the strongest monster in the series right now. That he's the strongest dragon. That there are no other dragons who compete with him. That's not the case. I'm willing to bet money if Rover comes to the surface right now. Right now. It'll be an obstacle for Goro. A straight up obstacle for Goro. And I would not be surprised if we got a hold of the Darkshine Dilemma situation for Goro if Rover shows up and fights him that way. Or if he ends up going after him like that. And the situation is changed now. It's not like how we had even natural water in this big lake format on the surface where Garou was able to blitz him right after Platinum Sperm. This is a this is a much bigger, a different entity right now. We have this sage monster who's out here as well. I would be I would be disappointed if Garou overcomes these two obstacles without any hitch, without any problem. The amount of characters who can now intervene or interfere with the storyline are limited. The S class is basically out of commission now. Besides a few heroes here or there, you can mention Metal Bat, you can mention um, uh, a King, and you can mention other characters coming back if you want, and you can mention Saitama if you want. But works through Saitama as an entity, as a group of his own. The rest of the monsters are out of commission as well now. Homeless, Fuhrer, Gums, Goro's the principal one out here with even natural water. Now you have this sage thing, a declaration of, of godlyhood, which will be interesting and we'll discuss in a little bit. I would be thoroughly disappointed if Garou beats these two individuals, these two gargantuan monsters, in a chapter, in a single chapter. Don't get me wrong, I'm expecting Garou to somehow overcome or get through these issues, because these monsters have to be defeated somehow in some way. Coincidentally, we do have Cape Baldy here who could probably deal with these problems, but I don't want this arc to end. I don't want it to end. The fact that he's on the surface is the biggest warning sign, the biggest red flag, the big, the biggest just <laughs> yeah, sign is the best way to put it, that we're getting towards the end of the arc. He's the problem solver. The resolver. But we have growing problems here still. Immediately after this, the page that we're on right now in regards to discussing the chapter through in this review, um, Blast shows up, but it's not really Blast, it's God. Now, we were somewhat trying to discuss what the validity of God physically manifesting in front of Tatsumaki there was, but it seems that the fact that King didn't notice God there, but noticed Blast there, that seems to solidify the fact, to a degree, that no, Blast was mentally presenting himself there. He was in Tatsumaki's head. Is he not going to get resolved? What's what's the true ending for God in his arc? Psychos, Orochi, Homeless Emperor, the Sage King. This is now arguably the fourth entity in which... God has influenced the stance of battle. So, is that just going to be the end of the arc there? Like, I'm bringing God up in this conversation or in this topic of 
Goro not ending these two individuals quickly because it matters. If Goro isn't going to be the one to beat these two individuals, then it's probably going to be Saitama because there aren't the heroes don't have that much more firepower left to bring down guys like this. They're going to have to have other interfering forces to come in. And Blast seems to have left as well. So the individuals who can bring down these guys seems to be uh, uh, Goro and Saitama. Unless I'm confusing who else is on the surface still right now. Are we going to get a Metal Bat versus a Centipede rematch? Is that what we're pretending? Throughout the fight versus Platinum Sperm and Flashy Flash, Goro got a chance to show his capabilities. There was one comment in the chapter that alludes to some form of growth, but this doesn't necessarily mean that he grew. And that's a point that I'm speculating the most upon. The narrator reads, Accelerating forever, just like Goro's synapses. And this was in regards to them moving faster in the fight after Flash Flash had been knocked out. So I'm not sure if this is just a description of how fast Goro's moving and Goro's feet in the fight, or if it's saying that Goro was growing mid-fight. If that's the case, am I supposed to be expecting Goro to, to grow while fighting other uh, Sage Centipede to the point where he can then defeat him somehow? Is that going to be the same case for even Natural Ocean now? I... I don't believe that Goro's growth here should be capable of defeating these two individuals but we have not seen the capabilities of these two individuals sure sage centipede seems to be much 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 larger than elder centipede much larger than most of the monsters we've seen so far probably even sairoji but we haven't seen his powers yet we've seen his pincers we've seen him lift the drill and crush the drill that tatsumaki just used to slam um uh, orochi into the ground underneath the association into the lava but Am I to expect Goro to reach power levels comparable to Tatsumaki right now? That's probably one of the greatest speculations of who's going to fight who next. Moving forward, because there's a few more things we can talk about. Quite a few, actually. <laughs> um, God and Tatsumaki. Seeing Platinum come back up out of the ground as a girl slammed him was badass. But this shocked me. This is crazy. In the live reaction, I made a joke that if Tatsumaki were to get imbued by God, she could potentially be a sun cutter. Forget the earth cutter. And it's not an exaggeration to, <laughs> to the capabilities that we've seen so far. Orochi was very, very powerful. And we really only got to see him compete up against Saitama. So, it's difficult to really gauge him on his own. But he's very, very powerful. Psychos was a high dragon. Mid dragon, high dragon. Especially for her capabilities and her intelligence. But... Boosting her wouldn't have wouldn't have gotten you an Earth Cutter. Homeless Emperor was a nobody, and we saw how strong he became. It's actually pretty funny that we can go from the base level of homeless, right, and he became like a high dragon. Psychos, who was a uh, yeah, high dragon, you fuse her with um with a Roti, and above dragon levels. So the boosts seem to be pretty great. Imagine somebody who was already at that above dragon level. Imagine somebody who beat the boost right there. That crazy, that crazy jump. Imagine Tatsumaki being boosted by God. You know, Homeless Emperor was already talking about like humanity and, and ending stuff before he was imbued by god psychos was already hell-bent on beating 
her enemies beating the Hero Association before she got powered up by God. So what would have happened if Tatsumaki got powered up by God? Like, would it would it have been some? Would she have turned evil? Would she have been good? That's that's what I'm kind of trying to ask now because I don't think God is changing your intentions or controlling these people. It doesn't seem like it's like that. It really seems like it is a deal. It's an offer that you're getting and you're doing what you like with these powers. So what is he getting out of what is he getting out of this? Coincidentally, it seems like all the people who he's boosted have been against the heroes. So why offer it to a hero? That's one of the best questions to ask. Why Tatsumaki? We see her power. We get that reason why. But don't you think she would have used that against him? I just, nobody really has realized that. Even Psycho hasn't realized that. Orochi hasn't realized that. Like, Homeless didn't realize that. Can you even go up against God? Where's the physical form? Where's, there is no physical form of God, though, you see. As far as we can tell, God was not on the moon. Or was he? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, like why Tatsumaki? Why choose her? Is he under some, some assumption or, or, or some capability that he can control her? Would she have inadvertently attacked the heroes? Or are God's plans not dependent upon who he's given power to? Or the Hero Association or the Monster Association? We know he clearly doesn't like Blast. And Blast is the number one in the, in the Hero Association. It's a, it's a tough question. In the pages that were left out, the additions were context to try and like cloak a veil, put a veil over a cloak of um, God's intentions, right? To make it seem more genuine or more real that Blast showed up out of nowhere to help Tatsumaki, to protect Tatsumaki. It was a nice sequence. Uh, it was, it's still kind of tough. Because the dialogue itself gives it away the entirety of the time. Like. The fact that Blast was. <laughs> I guess it's really only the fact that we he, he told us that he was leaving multiple times. And that we saw him leave after dropping off um, uh, Saitama and Flashy and Monaco. That we would believe or have an expectation or find it weird that he's back on the surface. Up until you get to the quote to where it's blacked out and Taksumaki reminiscences and mentions, when the time comes, don't go expecting someone to come save you. Then she opens her eyes and says, who the hell are you? And then we get the face of God. A scary face. Confirmation of this. And oh my God. One one of the more exciting parts of this chapter. God's offer to Tatsumaki. Oh, what a what a possibility! What a possibility! But thankfully, Tatsumaki had that quote in her head. She knew and admired Blast enough that this offer of God wasn't going to work. That she was able to overcome and persevere, and <laughs> she didn't she didn't have that um that need or desire for power. Now, if Fubuki was offered, this might have been a different story. She wants power. She wants power. Um, it was kind of cool to see um, Blast acknowledge King immediately <laughs> and, and trust Tatsumaki to him. Um, the dynamics of what we've seen or what we know happened in the chapter of these characters that are working with Blast, apparently. We'll talk about them in a second. It makes you think about the scope of the power scaling in a whole different manner now, because there's a whole nother level. So what does it mean to have Blast talk to King, the strongest man? Blast is the number one hero. King is not. He's like seven or something like that, seven or six. But he's the strongest man. We've seen the opinion that somebody even like Child Emperor has of Blast. We've seen King 
even perform in front of Bla in front of Metal Bat. So I said Blast. Um, the opinion of somebody like Todd Emperor has of King. We've seen Metal Bat physically see uh, King perform. <laughs> So it's not like we can't give prestige to the name of Strongest Man. It's not like it's some some rumors claim that some people are saying like, no. We've seen now in this series and solidified, confirmed and, and upheld multiple times now that the majority and the consensus amongst the people in One Punch Man is that King is the strongest man. The number one hero is now talking to the strongest man. How cool of a moment is this? Why didn't Blast realize that King isn't really strong? Nobody has. It's, it's not that it's inconsistent. We don't have a pattern for it. The only pattern is that we actually have is that there is no necessarily obvious way to tell how strong somebody is. Boros was able to see how strong Saitama was. God damn it. It's, it's crazy it is. Dr. Genius managed to make a being who was also capable of seeing how powerful um, Saitama was. But it wasn't the same. It wasn't. I don't know if, it, if it's good to say it's the same. Because it was only after Karnas Kabuto had threatened, had attacked, um, had gotten close to, to, um, to Saitama and had... Saitama was about to react to kill him. Was it that he realized how powerful Saitama was? It, it was more so that he realized that he was about to die in that moment. Kind of like a spider sense almost. Spider-Man spidey sense. I don't know. I don't know what, consistent, what the consistency is. We just have to get more information about it. But for now, it looks like Boros is the best one in regards to... Measuring people's strength. Even even Goro mentioned that Giro Giro's ass levels were all wrong and if the, and after. The quote of the chapter. I am not fighting alone. I'll leave Tatsumaki to you. I've got to head back and provide backup. What? So there are f five, three, eight other individuals. The S class is nothing now. They're just another rank. They've, they've been relegated to the significance of A-Class now. Not the premier class. But we have no information about this premier class. So the S-Class is still as relevant. They're still the most... Some of the most detailed characters in the series. And that makes sense now as to why... We get so much attention to them. But it, it, it makes it even more badass that we know so many of the other heroes in the series. We've met so many of the other A, B, and C class heroes just unanimously just lounging around and dealing with the other earthly stuff that's going on or just mundane stuff or problems that are going on with the monsters with monster appearances in, in throughout the One Punch Man world. And then we get the big boy threats, the big problems that come with the S class or the certain events for them. But it's just it's it's like, what, what's next now? How strong are these guys? We don't know how strong Blast is. We don't know how strong Blast is. He's strong as hell. Strong as Tatsumaki. But we don't know how strong Blast is. I'm assuming he's not stronger than Boros. But why did Boros get through? Were they busy? It makes you question now. So, talking about Boros, this is something that we talked about in the Discord. If these guys are dealing with threats 
much larger, much more important than the threats that are happening here. And attacks like the Earth Cutter, people taking from the core of the Earth can happen. And Blast still doesn't feel that he's needed here. Doesn't feel the need to come and, 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 and address these problems as the primary threat. Then why did Bla why did Boros get through? Does this confirm that Blast is stronger than Boros because they didn't react or they didn't arrive when Boros is here? Are, are we to not make an assumption? Is it wrong to make an assumption that this force of nine heroes, including Blast, has a omnipresent surveillance over the Earth? Can there not be threats that happen on the planet without them acknowledging it? Obviously, that has to, that has to be the case, that they're not paying attention to every threat that's happening on the Earth. But we're assuming that it's because it's not significant enough. So are we to pretend that, like, Boros snuck through? Whenever Boros' ship arrived, it was in an instant. All of that happened in an instant. He arrived on the Earth, decimated a city, and then heroes came out. And it was not so long after he had decimated a city that he was gonna go. They were, they were gonna do another consecutive strike. So were they just too fast? That doesn't seem plausible. Why did Boros get through? It's either a lack on these nine heroes' part or fighters' part, this team's part, or they purposely let him through. It's kind of scary that somebody who could destroy the surface of the earth would be purposely let through. God is the threat that Blast is after. And he's been after as a hobby, it seems like. This guy is for quite a while now. So is this what this team is for? To hold off the threat that is God indefinitely? That makes it a, a make God the overarching problem of the story of One Punch Man. There are more things to speculate in regards to the arrival or the presentation of these other eight heroes that Blast is providing backup to. Are they stronger than Blast? Is Blast the leader of them? Are these some of the individuals who will be matching Saitama, who will finally give Saitama the threat, the challenge that he needs and he's looking forward to? There are many more things we could ask about this. There's a lot. Sage Centipede. Nice design. I don't like the like the arm thingies. Those look kind of weird. <laughs> it almost looks like a caliper or something like that. <laughs> but the face part, the head part, reminds me almost exactly of the centipede. Almost as ferocious. It's funny because in context outside of the um of the story in an interview Murata says that he didn't necessarily like drawing other centipede because it was a lot of work a lot of work but now we're back to an individual as big and as powerful <laughs> it takes as much much of the screen as other centipede did so i'm wondering if he's going to get a different display i'm wondering if we're not going to get a chance to see um, the genos of the centipede treatment. Is Sage going to get clapped in a whole different method? I know we talked about in the middle of the video that I would be super disappointed if Grover overcomes these two guys in one chapter, but... <sighs> the dialogue here is one of the most... It's probably the most interesting part of the last two panels. Besides the design of Even Natural Ocean and, and Sage Centipede who is just towering out of the hole here. Just towering. He just makes everything look minuscule, bro. He had one, two, three, four, four arms out of the ground, and he was already made grow look minuscule, reaching the moon. The dialogue reads, Insolent tiny humans, which is the part that gives me the most confusion. Hear me. 
We have been sent here to destroy the abominable fist that turned against God by the incarnation of our father, the earth. Who is, who is we? I guess he's referring to even natural ocean and even natural and, and say centipede and the incarnation of our mother, the ocean. Suffer divine retribution and destruction. Now it's clear that in a previous chapter, Garou mentioned that his god slayer fist would even bring down gods. But this is just a moniker for the name of the technique. I'm not, I don't understand why there's an implication here. Why this character, God or whatever, is being offended by this. Or if this is the reason for the creation of this creature. Or the, the, the resurrection or the ris rising of this creature. I don't know what it is. I don't know why even natural water is talking now. This is probably the most confusing part of the chapter. If we were to get a reread or, or a redraw, I would want to give more context or have more context or more dialogue explaining this. Maybe the next chapter will it clarify and elaborate more upon this. But as of right now, are there two gods? There are more topics that can be discussed over chapter 156. And there are different opinions that are not my own and that contrast my own for chapter 156. That you can hear and maybe even add to in tomorrow's One Punch Man podcast. We've done a series of podcasts for quite a few chapters now. I believe since chapter 94. So if you want to follow along, if you want to Immerse yourself in the One Punch Man storyline with the community. The One Punch Man podcast is the best place to do it. It's one of the best videos. So check out the One Punch Man podcast for chapter 155. So that you can easily slide into 156. See y'all boys next time. Yo ho ho!